McLaren take control of the Constructors' Championship after Oscar Piastri masters the Baku Chaos to win the Azerbaijan Grand Prix. Elsewhere, Carlos Sainz and Sergio Perez are involved in an unexpected and sudden penultimate lap crash. From Racing News 365, my name is Nick Golding and I'm joined as always by lead editor Ian Parks. Ian, I am so, so pleased that I decided we wouldn't do bold predictions after qualifying <laughs> because I correctly predicted it would be a chaotic race. Didn't give us the red flags and no. safety cars we were expecting, but I don't quite know where to start. Oscar Piastri brilliantly winning his second Grand Prix. The crash between Perez and Sainz. George Russell inheriting somehow a podium. Norris going from 15th to 4th, taking more points out of Max Verstappen. Verstappen complaining yet again of jumping. Hamilton having an unusual problem with his Mercedes. I mean, there are stories everywhere, but I think we've got to start with Sainz and Perez. Both drivers are having an excellent race. Perez, one of his best weekends for a long time. We know he's very, very good in Baku, but whilst fighting Charles Leclerc for second place for all three drivers, it ended very badly for Perez and Sainz. Yeah, I'm gonna I have to say I'm gonna start off first of all that for the first fifty laps, Nick, that was arguably a race for the F1 purist because yeah. at the end of the day, I was still captivated by what was taking place because it really was an enthralling race from start to finish. And of course you've touched on it there with that absolutely chaotic finish and that crash involving Sergio and Carlos Sainz. But yeah, as I say, that first 50 laps, it was just like, is Charles going to get the move on Oscar? Because, you know, they went through the first stint and uh, it was one, two, Charles and Oscar. And then finally, when they, once they'd switched from the medium that they'd started onto the hard tyres, Oscar managed to get the move on Charles on lap 20. Brilliant, another brilliant move. Um, you know, we saw it in the previous race in Monza where he overtook Lando on lap one. Well, this was a, a great move on Charles. It came from so far back. And I think it really caught Charles by surprise. I don't think he was genuinely expecting Oscar to pull the move into turn one as he did. Oscar superbly controlled the car through turn one as well. And I thought that once he got that move done, he was then just going to sail away. But that did not prove to be the case at all. Charles Leclerc then proceeded to keep him honest pretty much for the next 28, 29 laps. Yeah. But regardless of DRS along that 2.2 kilometre straight, regardless of the fact that he was constantly within five tenths, six tenths, seven tenths of a second, you would have thought, given the DRS, given the length of the straight, that that would have been an adequate gap to close down going back into turn one. But he could never, ever at any stage get within a striking distance to pull off a move on Oscar as Oscar had pulled off on him on lap 20. And consequently, remaining in the dirty air of Oscar for that period of time and all that period as well, trying to make that move stick as he radioed over with about, I think it was about three, four laps to go, his rear tyres had absolutely shot their bolt. They were they were falling off a cliff. That then naturally, naturally led to Sergio Perez closing the gap. Over that third, over that 28 lap stint between Oscar and Shaw, Checo had got close on a number of occasions. Then he drifted back. Then he crewed back into contention again. So, as I say, Checo finally got the shot he needed. But of course, what it had also done, it, it had drawn Carlos Sainz into the equation. He was some way back. Three seconds. Twen- Three, four seconds. Yeah. Throughout that 28 lap period, he was, he was off the pace. But yeah, very slowly, he caught up to the back. So start a lap 51, we had Checo making a move on Charles, got a bit too, well, Charles did brilliantly to defend, really hugged the apex of the corner to such an extent that that forced Checo a little bit wide. 
in going a little bit wide that allowed Carlos then to sweep in underneath and move into that third position. But then, of course, coming out of turn two and along the straight into turn three, Carlos was a little bit slow out of turn two. Checo managed to pull up alongside, contact between the two, pair of them slammed into a, a concrete barrier on the side, huge damage, race finishes under a VSC, and Oscar takes what, for me, was a thoroughly deserved victory, yeah. bearing in mind the defence that he had managed to pull off over the course of that 28 laps, shall we say. To, to keep Charlotte Bay for that period of time, I just thought it was an exemplary masterclass in driving and he thoroughly deserved that victory at the end his second in formula one and obviously now we're going to come on a bit more deeply into the 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 checo and carlos crash neither driver at fault bottom line stewards investigated it was one of those where neither driver was wholly or predominantly to blame accusations of course flying either side checo blaming carlos carlos indicating he'd done nothing wrong as it coming out of turn two, he had followed his racing line as he had done for the previous 49 laps coming out of that corner. And in fairness to the stewards, they'd looked at the video footage over many laps previously. And yes, whilst Carlos drifted across, that was nothing more than he had done at any stage coming out of that turn two across the course of the race. So... Bottom line is, whether you're a Checo fan or you're a Carlos fan and you think your guy's in the right, the FIA have decided to take no further action on this one. I think it's right. I I genuinely think that's right on this occasion. I I cannot see how Carlos was really at fault. I know Christian thought Carlos was at fault. Checo confronted, even confronted Carlos after he got out of his cockpit of his smashed car. I've seen some video footage where Carlos was still sitting in his Ferrari. Checo goes up to him. And you can see kind of remonstrates a little bit. Huge frustration on his part. As I say, bottom line is no further action. We move on now to Singapore. And what's really interesting, you mentioned, obviously, Leclerc and Piastri's incredible move. In Park Ferme after the race, because Leclerc somehow managed to get his rear tyre to remain in second, actually accepted fault a little bit, saying that he made a mistake and needs to learn from this. He didn't defend as much as he probably should have done, which is quite clear. And you raise the excellent point that it does seem like Piastri just caught Leclerc so by surprise because of how late the move was. And actually, Leclerc's tyres, having fallen so far off the cliff, it almost kind of caught Checo and Carlos by surprise because it meant Leclerc's corner exits were so much slower. It was quite visibly drastic, the difference in speed. And obviously, Sergio even noted that actually Carlos's speed was so much faster than his because he was in the toe of a player who, who was going slow. And obviously the big winner, well, I say winners are George Russell, who was kind of having a bit of a nothing race with Max Verstappen inherited a podium. Lando Norris, arguably the biggest winner, given he started 15th after a miserable Saturday. It was damage limitation for Lando, yet he's somehow taken a few more points out of Max Verstappen's lead. It now sits at just 59 points. It also means with Oscar winning and Lando in fourth, with Checo retiring, Max only finishing fifth, that McLaren lead the Constructors' Championship by 20 points. Red Bull advisor Dr. Helmut Marko was asked after the race, can Red Bull still win the Constructors' Championship? And he said, absolutely no. Where would you like me to start then? That was a lot of points. It, it, this, is the, this is the point, though, <laughs> that I kind of raised at the top of the show that there was what was looking like a real race for the F1 purists, given that it looked like it was going to be a battle for the lead that went down right to the end. There's just been so many stories to come out of a race which had no red flags, no safety cars, and it's yeah. been spectacular, really. Yeah, let, let's start with Lando first, because let's start with the title <laughs> the race. Let's start point. with Lando. Yeah, let's start with Lando. Um, yes, it's a it, bit of a double-edged sword for him for this one. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be thinking he's going to be coming away out of this Grand Prix. Yes, on one hand, he's done a great job coming from 15th on the grid, takes fourth at the checkered flag. Yes, he, of course, he inherited a couple of positions right at the end there given the, the Checo and uh, science clash. So, and he's, he's gained three more points on Max. Two points for the fact that he finished 
um, fourth compared to Max's fifth. And of course, he also got the point for the fastest lap. Did an absolutely brilliant job on that first stint. Was one of the, the handful of drivers that opted to start on the hard tyre. And it proved a winner at the end of the day for him because we saw very early on that the medium, particularly given the weight of the, the cars with the fuel on board, was really struggling. Drivers were making pit stops after 8, 9, 10, 11 laps uh, and for the few laps that followed. But Lando managed to eke out that first stint. At one point, he managed to get himself boxed behind Alex Albon. And that looked like it could really hold him up because at that stage, he was looking to open up a gap to, I think it was Aston Martin's Fernando Alonso further down the grid. He needed to try, get in and out and get out ahead of Fernando, who was then running in eighth position. As I say, he couldn't get close to Alex Albon. And then a little bit of luck that he needed, bearing in mind what happened in qualifying when he got caught by that yellow flag late in Q1 that eventually ended up with him getting knocked out and starting all the way down the back of the grid. He got that little bit of luck. Alex Albon pitted and he had a bit of clear air. That allowed him to eke out that gap, to get in and out, get in that pit stop. And then that allowed him a run on Max Verstappen, something that he thought was not good. Could could never imagine, I would assume, in his wildest dreams that he was going to be in a position to ultimately catch up to and then pass Max Verstappen late on. Bearing in mind, Max has started from sixth on the grid and Lando had ultimately started from 15th on the grid. So as I say, when I say a double-edged sword, he's going to be thinking, yeah, I've come out of this race with fourth position. I've gained three more points on Max. However, it's going to be a case of, but for that yellow flag at the end of Q1, how much better could this result have been? Because quite clearly... Once again, McLaren showed it has a magnificent race car. There was a few doubts coming into this race. Lando himself had even said that didn't, after Friday practice, that is, that he there was a lot of work to do, that he didn't feel he quite got the car for this racetrack. Well, lo and behold, McLaren has proven once again at a completely different circuit, bearing in mind Zandvoort was high downforce, Monza was low downforce. Now we have this street track that actually it does have the car for all circuits. So for the first time in 10 years, more than 10 years, McLaren has the lead in the Constructors' Championship. It depends how you want to look at it because I say it has the lead because the last time it actually led the Constructors' Championship was coming out of the very first race of the 2014 season, the Australian Grand Prix, when Kevin Magnussen and Jensen Button scored a 2-3. So as I say, prior to that, Again, you have to go a long way back as to when McLaren had the Constructors' Championship. So this is a massive thing now for McLaren. And they've really got a grip on this championship fight. Red Bull most definitely falling away. And as you've pointed out, Helmut Marko's comment, he's basically turned around and said, pretty much, we've got no chance now in the Constructors. And when you look at it as well, uh, Ferrari are only 31 points behind Red Bull and 51 points behind McLaren. They are not completely out of this title fight with McLaren. And the way things are looking right now, you put your, your money on Ferrari to at least finish second in this championship and Red yeah. Bull are going to drop back to third. That just goes to show how far Red Bull has fallen over this these last uh, eight, nine races or so. Uh, really quite extraordinary, this turnaround in form over the course of this season. But right now, McLaren has it within its grasp to win its first Constructors title since 1998. That will be quite something for the team. And of course, we now go into next weekend Singapore, which we'll discuss in more detail on Monday in the podcast. But that's historically, and also particularly last year, a very good venue for Ferrari. So that Constructors' Championship could take an even bigger turn next weekend. But looking at Max Verstappen in particular, obviously, does still lead Lando Norris by 59 points. It is still a very healthy margin with the races yeah. clocking away now in rapid fashion. But again, he was really, really unhappy with his RB20, complaining of grip, complaining more importantly and more crucially of jumping. And it's the jumping that 
is the real problem, it seems. We know that Red Bull have got these balance issues, these aero problems, as has been said by Christian Horner and Helmut Marker. But yes, Baku is a track where Perez is a specialist and Verstappen hasn't always enjoyed the best of weekends. But Verstappen is still really unhappy with his car. Yeah, I was just looking down at my notes while you were talking there, Nick. And uh, just in case people wondering while I was looking away, I wasn't being rude in any way, <laughs> shape or form. God. As you say, a, a couple of points that you make there. Yes, talked about his car, no rear grip. At one point as well, I made a note here on lap 25. He turned around and said that the brakes aren't working. This has become yeah. a little bit of the norm now for Max during a Grand Prix, that there is always something, an aspect of the car that he is not happy with. So, but why did Checo Perez do so well? Well, Christian Horner noted after the race that Checo going into this Grand Prix just managed to finally get his car in a good window, which is something he's not managed previously. And of course, Checo loves this circuit as well. That's an added factor. He's won twice here previously and, you know, he's, he's got a good affinity with the track. So he's got, a, as I say, all that combined allowed him to produce a really good performance up until, of course, the very start of lap 51, when it just unfold, unraveled, sorry, in spectacular fashion for him. With regard to Max, yes, it's 59 points, 78 to Charles Leclerc, 91 to Oscar Piastri. Seven races to go. Seven races to go, three sprints. So seven races, 175, plus the fastest lap, 182, plus 24 for the sprints. That's 216 points quick still on offer. Box. quick maths so <laughs> given the rate of decline of yeah. red bull and max given that the singapore grand prix is one in which red bull performed so abysmally at last season as we well know the only grand prix last year in which it failed to win across the most dominant season in f1 history this title picture if there is to be a repeat and Red Bull again struggles around the Marina Bay circuit as it did last year, those gaps could be significantly reduced. But of course, Singapore is one of those circuits, as with Azerbaijan, where pretty much you are guaranteed a safety car. I think there's been one, something like the last six or seven years in Singapore, there's been a safety car. So anything could happen. We don't know who's going to be involved in that safety car, how that could shake up the order. But yes, it, it's starting to look a little bit more precarious for Max, even though he will feel slightly relieved that he only lost at the end of the day three points to his main title rival in Lando. And you've got to think that the way things are looking between McLaren and Ferrari, that Lando, Charles and Oscar, they could easily take continue to take points off one another. And that could be the main factor that plays into Max's hands if he is going to be a four-time Formula One world champion. And of course, Helmut Marco has hinted that, yeah, and obviously, and obviously Marco has hinted that with Red Bull, nothing significant is going to change to his car until the United States Grand Prix. And obviously they will have that three-week break after Singapore to try and get on top of things. But let's go on to Mercedes and a really weird weekend. George Russell, okay, a bit of a nothing race, but ultimately right place, right time to inherit the podium. But more importantly, in Azerbaijan, Lewis Hamilton, a torrid weekend. Obviously, the big news on Sunday morning was that Mercedes have fitted a new power unit, meaning he started from the pit lane. But what's interesting is whilst he recovered to P9, another driver who actually only inherited points because of the crash on the penultimate lap. What's more crucial with Hamilton is some of his wording saying that on one end of the car, he had too much. On the other end of the car, he had nothing. He was having to yank, was his word, yank the steering through the corners, slide the car. But then the really bizarre thing is why Mercedes had to make a power unit change. And Lewis Hamilton told media that it was because one of the components of the power unit had not been correctly built. That in itself is really, really odd. I've never heard that before. And this is obviously something now that Mercedes is going to quite clearly investigate post-race. Obviously, they have very little time to investigate it, but at least Lewis has a brand new power, power unit in his car, as you're saying, Nick, that necessitated the pit lane start for him today. So at least he will have that going into um, 
Singapore Grand Prix next weekend, and then Mercedes will have enough time, you would assume, with that gap to appreciate and understand just what on earth has gone on with this incorrectly built component. Now, obviously, as we know, power unit is comprised of a handful of elements in talking about internal combustion engine, turbocharger, MG UK, MG UH, control electronics. So, and in this instance, for this brand new power unit, unit Lewis had engine, turbocharger, MG UH, MG UK. So it would be one of those that was incorrectly built, given that they were the four primary components that were changed. Remarkable state of affairs. And there was a key point as well. You mentioned about you, Lewis, having to yank the steering wheel. I remember a radio message through that Grand Prix. We pretty much turned around and said, paraphrasing, can't remember the exact wording, but do you now see what I'm on about, guys, with regard to me having to drive this car? So something fundamentally is at fault. And another key point that Lewis mentioned was he had one of his lovely Fridays. Lewis often yeah. has a number of good Fridays where he feels really happy with the car. And then going into the rest of the weekend, something happens that really changes things for him. In this instance, with regard to his post-race quotes, he'd mentioned that it was something minor that had happened. So it just goes to show what would now appear to be the, the extremely narrow operating window in which mm. Lewis uh, Mercedes have that W15 for Lewis. As you say, George was a relatively not nothing race because he did obviously eventually get up on the podium, yeah. but it was kind of like in that little bit of a no man's land in the in the yeah, middle of that. Top 10. Yeah, a little bit of no man's land for him, as as Max was for the most part as yeah. well, barely even mentioned across the course of the Grand Prix. Uh, so yeah, for, but for Lewis and Mercedes, yeah, a little bit of a concern with this power unit component, something that they're really going to have to dig deep into now and understand just what on earth has gone wrong with regard to one of their one of their components. For certain, just to quickly run through the official top 10, because there's been a few investigations after the race, it's taken a while, but the official top 10 from the Azerbaijan Grand Prix, Piastri claimed victory ahead of Leclerc and Russell, Lando Norris in fourth, Verstappen fifth, Fernando Alonso in a brilliant sixth, another driver who kind of just went under the radar throughout the race. Mm. Alex Albon in seventh. Franco Colapinto, the Williams rookie, in his second race in P8. A brilliant double points finish for Williams, which we'll speak about in a second as our final talking point. Hamilton ninth and Oliver Behrman has his rookie yet again in his second F1 race, also in the points. So let's finish things off by speaking about Williams, Colapinto, Albon, but also mentioning Behrman because for all three of them, a brilliant day. Yeah, it's uh, and when you think of what happened to Franco as well when he had that crash <laughs> in practice, I mean that was a, a tremendous recovery from that. You know, a young guy in only his second Grand Prix in F one, and he has that incident when so much focus is on him as well. Bearing in mind that he was propelled into that seat on the back of Logan Sargent and all the incidents that Logan has had, and obviously the yeah. one that really was the straw that broke the camel's back for Williams team principal, James Vells, was that crash, of course, uh, at the uh, over the Dutch Grand Prix weekend. And obviously that Logan out, Franco in, so for him to then come in and have this crash in practice here and only his second race, as I say, but then to pick himself up from that, do a great job in qualifying and do an equally as great job as well with regard to this performance today or on Sunday in the Grand Prix to get points, superb. Williams, 10 points overall. That's really elevated them now. Um, they were ninth position in the constructors. They've moved up to eight. They're within shooting distance of Haas and RB just ahead of them, but they're going to have to have a few more, a couple more good weekends like this to really propel themselves uh, above those two teams ahead of them. But nevertheless, what a shot in the arm for Williams overall and for Franco Colapinto. And as you mentioned, Nick, we'll touch on Oli Behrman again. Another driver who second, crashed. <laughs> another driver who, yes, had his own incident, of course, but came out of it again yeah. with a great, great points drive. And the 
fascinating stat about Oli Behrman is that he becomes the first driver in Grand Prix history to score two points, sorry, to score points with uh, separate teams in the first two Grand Prix of his F1 career. So hats off to Oli Behrman. That's uh, that's a little um, little fact there for the record books that will probably one of those that may never ever be beaten. Bearing in mind it's taken us over seventy, nearly seventy five years to get to this point in Formula One history that 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 uh, that we've had that feat before. So again, yes, he inherited it, but that's Grand Prix racing at the end of the day. You know, things happen; these incidents yeah. happen. You got to be there, right place, right time to pick up the points. Franco was there to, to score his points for Williams and Ollie was there to score his 10th place for Haas as well. So all credit to those two young guys. Great job. You've got to be in it to win it, they always say. What a day, what a race. It was something special. For those obviously watching this video, be sure to let us know in the comment section below your thoughts on the race and any of our talking points. And of course, make sure to smash the like button. But more importantly, subscribe to the channel if you want to be included in our latest prize giveaway over at Racing News 365, we are giving away several F1 model cars of your favourite team or driver. To enter, all you've got to do is be subscribed. As simple as that. For myself and Ian, we will see you on Monday for the latest episode of the Racing News 365 podcast, where we will try and unlock everything that happened in Baku, but also look ahead to Singapore. For myself and Ian, see you later. And if you can't join us on Monday, folks, then just to let you know, I will be in Singapore he to will. do the F1 Duplates from that circuit. One of my favourites on the Grand Prix calendar. Can't wait to get back there. It's been a few years, it has to be said. So I'm really looking forward to that one. So join us there for those F1 updates. And as always, until then, take care, folks.